Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is the first event of the year for the Sexuality and Political Economy um, stream called Queer Labor History and the Family as Digression with Sam Solomon. Sam is um, a, an academic who lives in Brighton, UK, where he teaches English literature and creative writing at the University of Sussex and co-directs the Center uh, for the Study of Sexual Dissidents. He's the author of Special Subcommittee and Lyric Pedagogy and Marxist Feminism, Social Reproduction and the Institutions of Poetry. And he is also um, the co-translator from the Yiddish of the Acrobat Selected Poems of Celia Dropkin. We are gonna have a sort of 45 minute presentation from Sam and then we'll also have um, an equal amount of time for questions and discussions after that. So thank you all for joining and Sam, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Alex um, and Paul, for um, coordinating and bringing me here. Um, I'm really looking forward to this um, and glad to have people here, including at least one person who I'll, who I'll talk about a bit. Um, so uh, I guess one thing I would say is the title of Queer Labor History and the Family as Digression um, we'll see how digressive it ends up being. Maybe not that digressive because there's an urge within me to like refold in the digressions, but we can think about that or I might keep thinking about that. But I'm gonna start with an overview of this research project um, that I've been undertaking for a number of years. Um, and this talk is an attempt to bring together some of the different um, narrative and poetic and personal forms by which I've come to know gendered histories of print and typesetting. Um, and that's both through scholarly research and through family history. Um, so my grandfather and then father's small business provided print and divine ser uh, design services for trade unions, left and civil liberties organizations and small literary ventures. Um, and I wanna see how the gaps and overlaps between these ways of knowing might illuminate the sexual and class politics of literary labor and to ask um, what these histories might mean for queer labor struggles today. Um, and I wanna note just as a kind of unincorporated um, aside that pretty much all of the people or many of the people I'll be talking about at length are people of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage who were in some way opposed to the Zionist project. Um, and in some cases that's as part of leftist organizations. In other cases, it was more personally, it might've been a you know like Leslie Feinberg, something they fought for quite passionately or a more private thing. Um, and I don't know yet how or if to incorporate that internationalist dimension in the work I'm doing in an integral and non-superficial way, but um, as a reflection on where I'm speaking from and the lineages I'm speaking in relation to um, during an ongoing genocide, it feels important to note that. Um, so the majority of print production in the mid late 20th century United States saw a shift, I'm gonna get technical straight away, from line casting, so this was how typesetting worked with heavy machinery that would cast hot metal linotype slugs, little bits of metal um, that would go into letterpress printers. Um, that shift shifted from that to what comes to be called phototype setting, which is more or less computerized at different moments and two dimensional um, and feeds into photographic based printing offset lithography where plates are photographically developed. Um, the introduction of phototype setting, which is a shorthand name for a larger process, photo composition of stuff for print, brought with it some major changes in the demographic composition of printing and pre-press labor. Um, and so what I'm gonna give you here is just a tiny video that shows the New York Times, um, the New York Times basically 
um, when they they were quite late in shifting away from linotype to phototype setting, and they did a video about it. Um, and I'll just show the minute of transition as it's memorialized in this video, um, which hopefully you can see. It so is the end of the age of hot type mechanical printing. Leaving the photo, the linotype studio, which you can see as a sort of industrial space. Um, and the beginning of the new, the computerized cold type, the electronic. So notice we have a computer screen, desks, what look like, Word processors, they're not. They These seasoned like printers, typewriters, sort of. brain, have made the transition from the old to the new. The electronic images of letters that I have just set on this video display screen, I'll now send to the computer, where it is processed, stored, and brought back when required for corrections. Okay. So it's on. I just managed to, to the computer. Hold on. When needed, a touch of a keep. I unshared but didn't pause it. Okay, there we go. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of a, a look at the kind of technological cha change that I'm talking about. Um, but just to kind of show you, um, which I forgot to do a moment ago. Uh, let me just share this. There we go. So, yeah. We've got the typesetting shift, which is for the second category here, from line casting to photo typesetting. And there are lots of demographic shifts that take place. Um, quite crucially, we see a shift from a predominantly white male dominated um, world uh, to something that starts to resemble, as you could see, um, typing, which is generally a more feminized role. Um, and as Cynthia Coburn argued in her 1981 book, Brothers, um, which is about the effects of this change on the predominantly white male linotype workforce, um, from the point of view of capital, she argues, this technological change wasn't only about increasing labor productivity and profits, it was largely about breaking down workers' political power. Um, and typesetting had long um, been a white male dominated trade in the United States and Canada, and the International Typographical Union had tight control of, type, of training, apprenticeship, and labor market inputs for most large scale printing. And this was in the, in the US and Canada, the ITU. Um, so as my first digression, which it is truly, I'm in the British Library reading a book called Union Democracy, The Internal Politics of the International Typographical Union, originally published by New York Free Press in 1956. The book is a pretty influential work in labor and organizational studies and sociology, and I'm looking at the copyright page, which includes the note that the book was designed by Sidney Solomon. Um, that's my dad's uncle and my grandfather's younger brother, Sidney. Uncle Sidney was a lifelong anarchist, book designer, and publisher. So I asked my dad, who says, yeah, Sidney worked for a while with the free press. Um, at that time, that was a largely civil libertarian nonfiction trade press. Um, and dad says, you know, Uncle Sidney was a pretty well-known book designer and typographical expert. He had the largest typographical library I've ever seen. Um, he was a collector and he was the art director of Macmillan for a while. Um, so I only sort of knew that and I never really paid attention to it. Um, and the book is called Union Democracy, the Internal Politics of the International Typographical Union. It's by some sociologists, um, Lipset, Trow, and Coleman. Um, so anyway, we can put that digression aside 
To make photo typesetting technology workable in practice, you still needed workers, um, of course, but the skills and training involved in the work were quite different. So large scale print bosses at daily newspapers now could demand, as you saw in that kind of video, um, that their mostly white male linotype workers had to retrain um, for new photo composition jobs. Um, those jobs were often reclassified, um, changed pay scales, or else they could opt to get rid of the old workers and hire new ones or contract out to agencies um, often involving women who could be paid less and who, in a lot of cases, more likely already had facility with the QWERTY um, layout used in photo typesetting, like a, like a um, typewriter. Linotype keyboards had been laid out differently. They didn't afford touch typing, and they were understood to require sustained physical strength um, and the risk of burn injuries. So... In the United States, the ITU, the union I spoke about, tended to approach the rise of photo typesetting and the threat it posed to workers' power with what I would describe as a, and others have, as a rearguard craft unionist strategy. So the national policy focused on negotiating contracts that would guarantee lifetime employment or early retirement for existing composition workers, existing typesetters in exchange for allowing their existing jobs to be phased out. So basically we'll protect our men was generally the union's approach. And that approach won out on the whole over efforts to unionize the large numbers of women, queer people, people of color, women and queers of color who were increasingly finding employment at non-union photo setting shops. Um, Many of them were soon to be employed as typesetters in new non-union typesetting businesses and many pieced together work as freelancers. Um, there were unionizing efforts among these workers, of course, um, but they generally didn't have buy-in from the national union or indeed from some of the workers themselves. Um, and J. Dakota Brown has done some work on, on that um, following up some of that. Um, in other words, basically, job setting as a job was in a long and complex process, sorry, typesetting as a job was in a long and complex process of feminization, by which I mean that the price of the labor power of the workers who did it was depressed by political means as it became associated with women, as it became dissociated from strong labor unions. So in other words, feminized workers could be paid less and were subject to worse terms and conditions, as is frequently the case. This created a complex situation. Um, more marginalized people could now, through precarious waged work, have access to more of the means of print production. Um, this included women in general, but queer and trans people, people of color, radicals and women's liberationists more broadly. Um, and the main requirement for doing this work was literacy, a degree of technical proficiency, and the capacity to learn about what makes for good basic typographical design. Um, sometimes that was within very set parameters. Sometimes it involved considerable imaginative um, initiative, as you might expect. I've looked um, at length at Leslie Feinberg's pathbreaking Stone Butch Blues as an example of a text that engages with this history. Um, and I read the novel sections on typesetting as part of the novel's bigger project to narrate literary labor as a pivot point in late 20th century gender and sexuality. And so the novel's plot, in, um, in the plot, the protagonist Jess works as a freelance typesetter in the final third of the novel. And that index is precisely the period in typesetting history I've been discussing so far, this contradictory and enabling interval between sort of the initial busting of unions um, or th threats to unions, um, the feminization of the labor, and what would be the extinction of a trade altogether, the end of, of typesetting as a large scale trade, um, which I'll mention. But um, and it registers the challenges, Stone Butch Blues registers the challenges that labor organizing failed to meet in this context. Um, so one moment from 
the novel's final act, just get us to, um, helps to set out some of these literary labor relations and their significance. So Jess, until this point in the novel, has suffered constant setbacks in efforts to find reliable employment. And Jess finally lands relatively well-paid work as a typesetter in New York City. After one year of freelance typesetting, Jess tells Ruth, um, a trans woman, an intimate friend, um, that I always wanted to leave something important behind. Remember the history book you gave me for Christmas? I've been going to the library, looking up our history. There's a ton of it in anthropology books. We haven't always been hated. Why didn't we grow up knowing that? I grew up believing the way things are is the way they've always been. So why even bother trying to change the world? But just finding out that it was ever different, even if it wasn't long ago, made me feel things could change again, whether or not I lived to see it. Um, at work, when everyone else is at lunch, I've been typesetting all the history I've found, trying to make it look as important as it feels to me. That's what I want to leave behind, Ruth, the history of this ancient path we're walking. I want it to help us restore our dignity. So there are at least two ways to interpret Jess's insistence on the dignity of typesetting histories of queer and trans life. One of them is that the professionally typeset and offset printed um, book would confer by virtue of its format, a sort of legitimacy that's not otherwise granted, um, that would not otherwise be, sorry, granted to the history of gender variant people. Um, so notably Feinberg herself worked as a freelance typesetter for a number of years and did some of that work as a member of the Workers' World Party, turning radical writing into printed matter. Um, a second implication of this claim about dignity might be that the work of typesetting itself, which Jess is doing for a wage and doing after hours on the sly, that that work might help to restore the collective dignity of trans people in the present. So the adjacency of that work, the, the job to textual or literary production organized in a large scale capitalist form might be part of the source of dignity that Jess seeks here. Typesetting all the history is a form of literary labor that restores dignity, both because an elided history is being restored, providing a stable ground for contemporary trans life, and also because history is being written down for print in the book or pamphlet form by someone who might be able to earn a living doing that activity. Print is both the medium of access to the ancient path, um, which is you know, a developmentalist and primitivist ethnography is going on in, in the background of, of this, um, but print is the medium of access to that ancient path and the means of restoring dignity and making a contemporary world in which trans people are agents rather than historical relics. The work of typesetting itself is isolating, causes headache and strain, um, but it's also rewarding and satisfying in a number of ways. So um, just a later point in the novel, um, Jess says, at night I lived inside the coding strings, my face illuminated by the ghostly light of the terminal. The code phrases became my poetry. The curves of type against space sang to me. The melody meant everything. The words meant very little. As evidenced in other testimonies from the same period, phototype setting was experienced as a pleasurable skill by many people who might not have found work in print previously, in spite, you know, so pleasurable in spite of the pain and drudgery that could accompany it. Um, and expressions of pleasure at the mastery of this new skill, I would, I have argued, and those expressions of pleasure entail a rejection of the language of de-skilling that was often used to talk about the, um, the transition from linotype to phototype setting, um, and that generally accompanies the feminization of labor um, in, within any trade. 
So phototype settings adjacency to industrial capitalist literary production is a partial source of dignity. And in Stone Butch Blues, Jess acquires typesetting skills through casualized work. Like many typesetters at the time, she also require, acquires regular access to the machinery. And it's through both her waged and her after hours uses of typesetting machines that she begins to make sense of engagements with printed matter, feminism, labor history, and trans life that have been brewing across the entire novel. Um, and typesetting can allow Jess to put into print, perhaps even publish transgender histories um, about the collective capacity to change the world to some extent. Feinberg also includes in the novel's closing pages a common historical narrative about um, Bertram Power's industrial strategy as president of the ITU Local 6 in New York City. Uh, and I have a little bit of that here. Um, so I told him I'd stop taking hormones and move to New York City. Um, and now I was a typesetter. Non-union, he asked. I nodded. Yeah, when the computers came on the scene, the owners could see first how it was going to transform the old heat-led industry, linotype. So they hired all the people the old craft union didn't realize were important to organize. That's how they broke the back of Local 6. And so throughout the, um, the novel, Jess's formation as a character has hinged on the development over time of a sense that social and historical change are possible. And that's what drives Jess by her own narratorial account. Um, and that's what allows us as readers to read and imagine for the duration of the novel, historical outcomes other than those we know that the 70s and 80s delivered. So in the novel, the failures of white male dominated craft unions to take an expansive approach to the racial minoritization and feminization of various sectors, that failure to um, hire the people, the people to focus on the people the craft union didn't realize were important, that failure doesn't appear as an inevitable outcome in the novel. Instead, in moments like this, which tells us how management broke the back of the union, Feinberg suggests that different approaches to class struggle might have had different outcomes. And that's cemented by the novel's final pages in which Jess decides to become an openly transmasculine union organizer after reconnecting with her cis straight white male communist mentor, Duffy, um, and sort of dreams of a brighter collective future. So most of what I've just told you, I learned through what we might call scholarly research, um, reading secondary historical sources, visiting archives, close reading of diaries, some informal conversations with other researchers. Um, much of that arose specifically from research on the work of the Marxist feminist lesbian poet, Karen Brodine, whose work opened up to me the world of how people write and have written about and through these complex dynamics. So Brodine's long poem, Woman Sitting at the Machine Thinking, was written while she was doing precisely this work of phototype setting. Um, and she was organizing at the same time for the San Francisco branches of the Freedom Socialist Party, Radical Women, and the Women Writers Union. And I came to know Brodine's work when I was the education and bookstore coordinator of the Los Angeles branch of the Freedom Socialist Party. Uh, we had a closet full of copies of Women Sitting at the Machine Thinking that I often tried to shift at events as a featured book. Um, and I loved the book for its form and its content. And in some ways, it felt like a bridge between my academic interests in Marxism, feminism, and poetry, um, my political commitments to the real people who were around me um, in, in the Los Angeles Hall of the Freedom Socialist Party, and my own enjoyment of reading and writing poetry. And Brodine's poem, Woman Sitting at the Machine Thinking, begins by describing a typesetter doing everything at once. So she thinks about everything at once without making a mistake. No one has figured out how to keep her from doing this thinking, 
while her hands and nerves also perform every delicate complex function of the work. This is not automatic or deadening. And it goes on. Um, the feminization of typesetting work and its relation to organized labor is evident at a later moment in the poem um, in which she, oh, these have gone slightly out of order. All right, I'll just read this bit. In which she um, reports a manager's response to her writings. Um, so the manager in the poem says, you're, you're an electronic technician, not a typesetter. You're lucky to be shut out of the union. And the poem continues, I know that typesetters grow more capillaries in our fingertips from all that use. Here's a test, cut my fingers and see if I bleed more. So Brodine's work as a typesetter was both alienating and enabling. Much of her poetry reflects the extent to which language is meant to flow through the woman setting the type, who's treated as part of the machine, but who steals from it all the same and dreams of being with the machine in less alienating and more embodied ways. Um, as in this section, what if you could send anything in and call it out again? Anything, that's what I would emphasize there. I file jobs under words I like, red, buzz, fury, search for tiger, execute. The words stream up the screen till tiger trips the halt, search for seal, search for strike, search for the names of women. We could circle our words around the world like dolphins streaking through water, their radar, if the screens were really in the hands of experts, us. Think of it. Our ideas whipping through the air, everything stored in an eye flash, our whole history ready and waiting. So here Brodin teases out how capitalist communication technologies might be expropriated, shared and liberated against censorship precisely at the moment of the feminization of the labor that is working with these machines. The poem tells us to think of it, the collective ownership of the means of production, the idea that the machine, which in this case is both um, a video display terminal and a mainframe with storage, that that could belong to a collective of feminized and racialized minoritized people, racially minoritized people. So this dream of a queer feminist sort of techno-communism was enabled by the fact that all the machines were in one room, um, that the interface or screen and the information that it produced and called up were on site, that the point of production was relatively centralized. Um, that dream is bookended in retrospect by the fact that the full lifespan of phototype setting took place within a larger horizon of industrial transformation. And um, the writing on the wall throughout this is that at some point there's gonna be direct input of copy, basically writers and editors um, and uh, will bypass typesetting as a profession and incorporate it into something like graphic design. Um, that that's roughly the trajectory that will happen. Um, and few workers and perhaps fewer managers seem to have believed that photo typesetting would be a permanent fixture of print origination work. These jobs would probably just disappear. The feminization thing is part of the trajectory in its elimination completely um, as a viable job. As a next digression, my dad tells me a story. I'll leave out most of the details, but uh, basically a long-term relationship that he'd been in fell apart. He returned home one day in the early 70s to find that his dog, Sappho, was missing. Dad doesn't remember how the dog got that name, but within a matter of days, he receives a call from a lesbian woman who worked for him as a typesetter. She saw Sappho in a West Village park being walked by my dad's ex, and she intervened um, and got Sa Sappho back to my dad. My dad describes this wor worker as a butch lesbian, and I imagine this might have been her self-description as well, although I haven't managed to contact her. She worked for my dad for a number of years, initially as someone he contracted out to, and then directly as an employee, an in-house designer and typesetter. 
The period of the queer wage typesetter that I've studied was the same period in my dad's business. Sorry, someone muted me, which I don't think is the aim. Um, in 1976, uh, my dad, Mark Solomon, incorporated Filmark Lithographics as a C corporation in New York City, rendering Filmark Press defunct. Filmark Press, the original company, had been founded by my dad, Mark's father, brother of Sydney, who I mentioned earlier. Um, so my grandfather, Nathan Solomon, founded Filmark Press in the early 50s. Filmark is a portmanteau of the name of Nat Solomon's two children, Phil and Mark. The company name was the invention of my grandmother, Betty Solomon, nay Safer, Betty Safer. Betty had various part-time jobs throughout the 40s and 50s in addition to housework and child rearing duties, but she never formally worked at Filmark. She, like my grandfather, was affiliated with the Communist Party of the USA throughout this period and beyond. Mark Solomon, my dad, had attended part of a single semester of college, dropped out, and after an impromptu visit to the Soviet Union, returned to New York where he worked a range of jobs in mail order record distribution, as a taxi driver, and then as a construction worker and union carpenter for a number of years in the early 60s. As a young man, he thought that being a manual worker in a unionized trade would make his father, the communist, proud of him. That approval was hard to come by, however, um, and his brother, Phil, the astrophysicist, was generally the, the golden child. Um, so Nat, my grandfather, had been kicked out of City College himself in the 1930s, ostensibly for missing one too many classes, but in fact because of his Communist Party organizing as a member of the euphemistically named group, the Liberal Club. Um, Oakley C. Johnson, the faculty advisor for the student club who was subsequently fired, described my grandfather as follows. Nathan Solomon was a small youth with a roundish, ruddy face, not at all impressive in appearance, but definitely impressive in the effect he produced on others. He had abounding vigor, earnestness, and enthusiasm. Nat never planned to work in print. He'd worked throughout the 30s as a stationary clerk in Harlem, where he was a member of the CPUSA Harlem branch while attending night sessions at City College. And he and my grandma Betty organized him as the lone member of a one-man strike for better pay and conditions at the stationers where he worked. Somehow he won, I don't really understand, and subsequently found his way into paid employment as a trade union organizer. He worked for a number of years, um, this is in the 40s, as president of Local 830 of the Retail and Wholesale Employees Union in New York City. The passage of the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947 shook the US labor movement to the core, and it made waves within my family and within the print industry, waves that converge. Among other things, it required that trade union officials sign a non-communist affidavit. Um, Nat was called before the US Congress's special subcommittee to investigate communism in New York City distributive tra play, uh, trades um, and you know, went through the rigmarole of, are you now or have you ever been, pled the fifth repeatedly and quite eloquently, um, and then was prevented by means that aren't entirely clear to me he was prevented, um, but were quite common, from remaining a trade union leader and employee um, as anti-communists within the union movement pushed out those to the left. Uh, and here is a picture of Betty and Nat. Um, you'll note that my Uncle Phil is holding no double talk repeal Taft-Hartley law now, and my dad and their family friend um, who's on the right, I don't remember his name, but dad can tell us. Um, it says, keep wages up, rents down on theirs. Um, and this is, yeah, probably late forties, I would say. Um, so probably right around going to Congress and getting blacklisted time. Um, so the, the ITU, if we can recall, um, International Typographical Union itself 
underwent a massive strike wave in those same years um, in response to the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act and particularly its provisions to outlaw closed shops. Um, the ITU had heavily embraced closed shops to secure its control over hiring as much as possible and Taft-Hartley explicitly outlawed them, um, although some provision for union shops remained. Um, and according to the print historian Peter Romano, the ITU response to the passage of Taft-Hartley was to automatically terminate labor contracts if employers hired non-members of the union. So the first wave of phototype setting more or less coincided with this strike wave. Romano explains that the strike strengthened the resolve of newspapers to decrease their dependency on the skills of the typographical union. The idea of setting type photographically had existed for almost as long as the idea of photographically developed plates had. Um, and a dream, the dream of a technology that could do without those workers who had power was a strong one. The idea of removing stages of pre-press work was a powerful management dream, aesthetically moored to the lightness of the idea of the photographic, as opposed to the heavy, hot metallic processes that preceded them. And during these years, as communists were blacklisted from trade unions and other sectors, the Communist Party and other left organizations also worked to consolidate independent press power to bypass censorship and continue agitating and organizing. A number of communists and anarchists went into printing and publishing. In my grandfather's case, the Communist Party set him up as staff on a journal called March of Labor. His name doesn't appear at all on the March of Labor masthead in any of its issues in from the nine, entire 49 to 56 run, as I learned somewhat disappointed looking through um, the holdings of the magazine at NYU. Um, it seems likely that Nat, having been exposed by his subpoena before the Special Subcommittee of Congress in 47, was too visibly a communist to list on the masthead at a time of growing censorship. The only printed mention I can find of my grandfather's role with March of Labor, this journal, comes elsewhere in a later section, session of the Committee of Un-American Activities from early 1955, the focus of which was the investigation of communist activities in the Fort Wayne, Indiana area um, during the questioning of Julia Jacobs, the secretary of the UE Local 931 in St. Joseph, Michigan, which features two mentions of Nathan Solomon, um, one of which is the, the senator saying, I hand you a letter bearing the date October 8th, 1951, addressed to dear sister Jacobs, purportedly signed by Nathan Solomon on the stationery of the March of Labor. Um, the letter apparently referred to an order of 200 copies for which Jacobs had wired money and um, which Mr. Salom Solomon announced were being shipped. Uh, March of Labor had been conclusively judged by the committee to be a CP uh, front publication, which it kind of was, um, and many of its main stories focus on the damage wrought by the Taft-Hartley Act. Um, the key point here is that the Communist Party, well, among other points, hooked up my grandfather, both with an editorial job of some sort and soon after with a press. Um, by 1953, the CP, my dad thinks, bought an old print shop called Majestic Printing with Ludlow typesetting machines and letterpress printers and staffed it with people who could use them. My father speculates that the CP saw this as a way to expand their print reach in the peak of Red Scare years um, and in the light of rising censorship. So my dad said to me, um, this was 1953. It was at the turn when the industry had been moving into offset. So they bought a plant that was dated. I visited there a few times and it was like, it was literally from, you know, 1920. It was basically going out in terms of being competitive and my father took it on and he didn't know anything about machinery. He was political, he developed some clients. And based upon those few labor clients or progressive clients, when that business folded, he then founded Philmark Press, which was not really a press, but a print brokerage. So unlike his brother, Sidney, Nat wasn't a, you know, a skilled designer particularly. Um, Dad says, you know, he didn't really know anything about the lay of the industry. 
Um, but he developed a progressive client base as a print broker, including various um, Communist Party side projects. Um, that included some jobs that he farmed out to Prompt Press, which was the CPUSA's major in-house printing press. Um, my dad in his 20s, uh, later 20s, was the only employee at Filmark. Um, this was in the early 60s or mid 60s, I guess, early mid. And dad came into the business during these precise years of technological change. And I have one nice photo of him. Um, and he is here splicing in a correction, which is not strictly, I think, um, what you were meant to do, rather than redoing the entire negative for the prep for the for the plate, I think he's he's fixing something. Um, and yeah, beautiful photo. So Mark would end up within 15 years in charge of a successful, if small, print brokerage business whose primary clients would come to be the Hospital Workers Union and various other civil liberties and labor organizations including the New York Civil Liberties Union, sometimes the Emergency Civil Liberties, I forget what the C stands for, the N, ECLC, which formed when the ACLU failed to protect communists and other leftists during the Red Scare. Um, so I grew up with some of this as ambient knowledge, um, posters printed my, by my dad for 1199's, uh, that's the Hospital Workers Union's uh, Bread and Roses Cultural Project, so these posters like the Images of Labor Project or the Women of Hope, African-Americans Who Made a Difference, those populated the leftist spaces that I found myself in as an adult. And I could say, oh, my dad printed those. Um, but I came to this project in an entirely different way. Um, so in the process of research, I kept being repeatedly surprised by a host of connections that probably shouldn't be that surprising. Um, so for example, Karen Brodine's third book of poems, Illegal Assembly, was printed out of my dad's office by the Print Center, a small literary print shop that was nominally independent of Filmark, but worked almost entirely through Filmark. Um, print, the Print Center was run by the second generation New York school poet, uh, Robert Bob Hershon, who was one of the founding editors of the imprint and journal Hanging Loose, Hanging Loose uh, and the Print Center published Illegal Assembly and produced it out of my dad's office. Hanging Loose were affiliated with Filmark based on relationships, some of which had developed through my dad's and some of his staff's connections to um, the Teachers and Writers Project in New York. And I have actually published a reading from a poem in Illegal Assembly, um, this, this third book of poems by Brodine, the poem is called Opposites That Bleed One Into the Other or Collide. Um, I quite like the reading I did of this poem, but there's a stanza in the poem that I skipped over in my reading, um, one that has a somewhat particular meaning for me. Um, so this is, the boss worked his way up, one of those family operations. He treats his daughters like workers and his son like a son. He said what he really loves to do is work at the drawing board, but someone has to do boring administrative work. Um, Brodine wrote this poem while she was working as a typesetter for Communication Arts Inc. in the Bay Area. Um, it's a, it was a family run graphic design and typesetting shop. Brodine had failed to organize a union branch while working there, writing in a note to a comrade um, that we didn't have enough people to hold out for a union security clause. Hopefully we'll get it next time. Um, unfortunately, the boss is as prolific in offspring as in profits. He seems to have an almost unending supply of loyal children and loyal relatives. Um, so the boss in that poem and the boss that, that Karen Brodine wrote about to her comrades doesn't resemble my dad in terms of the size of his operation. Phil Mark employed very few people and certainly not in his attitude to his children, I don't think, um, but in simplified and abstracted terms, here I am, the son treated like a petty bourgeois son inheriting something. Um, if I'd started my project from my family's history, 
I might have already known to expect these kinds of a coincidences. Um, the means by which I know a lot of these things, the mediating forms of knowledge, make things resonate differently, open up different ways of seeing and connecting and being curious. Um, that's meant relearning a lot of things through research that I sort of already knew, but I didn't understand in a concrete way. So proper names that were, you know, just family connections that I didn't pay that much attention to, or background buzz noise about militant and radical histories um, that bestowed a kind of sense of distinction, but not any real or meaningful relationship. And another way to put that might be to say, um, as I said, sort of already, it had been a petty bourgeois kind of inheritance of these past relationships to organizing and struggle rather than a concrete and felt relationship that required anything difficult of me. Um, moreover, given what I know through my own relationship to queer and socialist feminist organizing, and in light of my own subsequent scholarship, there are two main kind of takeaways that are buried in this story about the development of my grandfather and father's business. Um, the main area of takeaway I want to note has to do with, you know, I mean, and this is something um, that I've already been thinking about, but um, has to do with organizing for class power within and beyond the industry itself. So my father and others managed to make this period of technological change, um, not that many others, some, um, into a profitable time for the duration of his working life. Um, but at the same time, accounts of feminized wage typesetters and printers um, bring to the foreground questions from the flip side, um, from workers and those who rely on wages and skills. Um, so questions about what winning could have actually looked like for the feminized typesetters described by Brodeen and Feinberg in their labor struggles. So when Jess talks about organizing all the people, the old craft people didn't, rec the old craft union didn't realize were important to organize. Um, what would happen then um, had the union behaved differently? So counterfactuals, um, but given the eventual obsolescence of phototype setting altogether, um, some kind of change in labor relations was inevitable. So winning for labor couldn't have meant maintaining the status quo. Class power instead would have to be built through integrated and inclusive organized struggle, um, reckoning with technological change and with changes that transform production processes that requires all of our collective imagination about what counts as winning in labor and other struggles, precisely working out what is and what is not inevitable. The second main takeaway for me is a parallel intertwined um, history wherein workers and leftist organizations have navigated changes in communication and print technologies um, where sort of outmoded technologies, machines in the process of becoming obsolete have been used as a short lived means of communicative freedom and flourishing in the face of political and social attacks on radicals. Got like one or two minutes left. Um, so the ways that my grandfather and others were set up by the CP with editorial positions and with aged out but still just about functional printing equipment has clear parallels to a number of other moments in radical history, certainly 60s, 70s, 80s radical print histories that are more commonly associated with the new left. Um, so for example, Daniel Obert, sorry, Danielle Obert um, documents how Freddie and Lorraine Perlman, a narco communist who founded the Detroit pr Printing Co-op, um, were helped by a comrade um, in Chicago to acquire a large Harris offset press. He introduced the Detroit, Detroit group to a dealer who had a huge warehouse full of secondhand printing equipment. Um, likewise, a number of women's liberation collectives launched autonomous for profit presses and typesetting shops in the 70s and 80s. Um, they were more often than not enabled by the advent of phototype setting with its routine revolutions in technology, making more outmoded machinery relatively affordable. The machines kept upgrading, the old ones still worked, they were cheaper. Um, Terry Wolverton recalls how as the Reagan era ended the LA woman building ability to rely on federal funds, um, 
they used a last round of funds to purchase computerized typesetting equipment to run a post-secondary education program, um, which they didn't have much time to run. And basically, then they had the equipment and they used it as the equipment to found the Women's Graphic Center in LA, which was a makeshift money-making endeavor to keep the building's feminist art projects afloat. Um, or earlier, uh, Margot Canaday recounts in her new queer career, how the lesbian feminist Diana Press was founded on the basis of volunteer labor and a limited amount of remaining cash that had been kept from the coffers of the DC-based um, Furies Collective. Um, so they used this money um, to purchase uh, a 25-year-old multi-lith 1250 and an instant plate maker. Um, and Canada cites Coletta Reed stating, that this was used equipment that most men would not have taken the time or the trouble to put into working condition. Um, but that's not really light years away from my grandfather's makeshift entrance into print on outdated equipment that set the groundwork for my own life of reading and writing in ways that I'm still only really beginning to know concretely. All right. I will stop there and thank you again so much to um, everyone for coming and to um, Alex really especially for inviting me and Paul for um, convening us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sam. This was really, really wonderfully um, done. So we have a good amount of time for questions and perhaps the dialogue with um, the audience. So if you, if any of you have questions, please do just raise your hand or you can put it in the, um, you can put it in the chat as well if you are unable to uh, read out your question yourself. I'll, I'm happy to read it out on your, on your behalf. Maybe Sam, I was wondering if you could um, talk a bit about Maybe just like the methods, like how did you go about recovering the family history? I I I I think some of your family members are here, but did you was this um did you get a lot of help from family members? Were you did yeah? Yeah. Um I mean a lot of this is my dad's here. Um we've been doing Zoom Zoom conversations that I record and then transcribe. Um and and I mean he can say it, but you know, he wanted to do that. I wanted to do that, um, and I used them for my own, um, <laughs> for my own, out of my own, you know, like, okay, tell me about this now, research, you know. Um, so that's that's kind of, that's going on there. But also I should say my, my one of my cousins, uh, Nina, um, did some oral history with my grandfather before he died. That was, and she's quite a bit, um, was born quite a bit earlier than I am, so um she recorded those so i have some some tapes like that and then some of it's and she kept some of his materials as well um including his fbi file and um other things like that which i've written about in poetic work and done stuff with that before but um i embarked on this this research project on lots of work on brody and feinberg feminist collectives and then this pro this talk today is kind of being like okay now you have to reckon with this other stuff that's that's in your your family because it first off because it's interesting um to me um and secondly because um because it's like it's clearly part of it i don't know how exactly and that's what i'm trying to work out um amazing um okay so we do have a question from amy in the chat hi amy so Amy asks, Sam, would you be able to talk a little about how these typographical histories and their relation to organizing and or sexual difference move into the present? Is that or will that be part of this project? Um, it's a great question. Um, and I think in some ways, not like in a definitive um like I think I still haven't figured out which afterlives of this you know let's say 60s to 90s moment um early 90s are the ones that I feel 
most competent to to, to delve into. Um, I think. I mean, I think the, the, there are very basic, obvious ones, which I wouldn't really have needed to do this research, but which my own sort of political education <laughs> provided, um, you know, as somebody in organizing about, um, about the limitations of, of craft union organization, um, I guess I would say. Um, and um, the, and the, the limitations of those for socialist politics. I don't think that, you know, requires in this company, I feel like that's probably more or less understood, but yeah, you don't, you know, you want to organize as many people as possible and you want to focus on and prioritize the organization of, um, the most precarious people. Um, I think, um, self-organization and, um, that, relates to immediately to the question of sexual difference and marginalization through it, the workplace and workplace organizing as places where feminization happens and is reproduced. Not the only places by any means, but one of the places where um, I know, I mean, I'm talking to Amy, um, who knows sort of her value theory much better than I do. And this isn't really a value theory question. It's a price of labor question that I'm talking about here in the context of the workplace, the political, um, you know, through misogyny, through racism, the political um, depression of the price of labor, basically. Um, and so that, you know, that sinks all ships, basically. Um, so that that's a general answer, but the as a research question, I think there are questions about things like zines, you know, um, and organizing through through communication and print media that I don't fully have my head around at the moment. There's a sort of resurgence of interest in the last 10 or so years um, in print, I think, as a kind of... Um, space away from online. Um, so a kind of reactive formation that happens in some, in some um, feminist and queer communities in particular that I've seen that might be interesting to explore. Um, Walter, was that, was that a hand raised? I see that a question, oh. How to? I, 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 I would have. Uh, hi, Sam. Hi, Mark. I see him too. Um, do I have the floor? Alex? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm also part of the Sam's family, related mm -hmm. on his mother's side. And I wanted to throw in the observation that uh, a good part of that extended family of those, gener those earlier generations was on the left. Um, in fact, um, they started off in Boston yeah. and some, some moved to New York. Uh, they were active in, like my father was active in the Sacco and Vanzetti campaign of the 1920s in, in Boston. Various relatives, mostly my aunts, that is women in the family, were active in the garment trades in, in New York. Um, most were members, I guess the, they were all over the left, uh, not just the Communist Party, although the greatest number were in the Communist Party, but they were also anarchists. Uh, one was a, a fairly well-known wobbly, uh, industrial workers of the world, um, and various other parts of, of, of the left. So I, I hope Sam will get a chance at some point to delve further into that family history. I would love to. And Walter, you have one of the few people who's produced some some of it that I've ever seen about um, about the village that people moved from. I think that your father might have provided. I don't know if that's right, but yeah. You're talking about our uh, history in Poland? And as, yeah. As, yeah, as, yeah, as yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know some of that, but not, not, a, not yeah. a whole lot. Anyway, um, Walter, that's great. I think if you, you know, in, in family history, great. If there's any connection to print, I'm extra interested, um, is what I would say. But... Um, 
but that's right. So yeah, that's my dad's mother's cousin, Walter. Um, well, the, the only connection to print is that I once visited Mark at Phil Mark in order to get advice as to where to get some radical publications exactly. produced. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So we also have a question from Emma. I'm, by the way, I'm, I know you can all read these in the chat. I'm reading this out loud because this is recorded and will be on YouTube and people who watch the recording can't see the, the chat. So Emma asks, I says, I have sort of the opposite of Amy's question, but does the association of technological shift and working class appropriation of means of printing and circulating of writing go back in time? Like, are there things from the 1930s or the 1900s uh, or the and, and 1910 moments of high radical action in the 19th century? What about the American focus versus international instances of similar dynamics? Um, I love that question too. And we'll, to some extent, say within this period, international, it's quite similar in a number of other countries. Certainly the UK history wouldn't look that dissimilar from what I traced in the US. The timings aren't exactly the same, but roughly the the class dynamics and the um, the sort of craft union control is the same um, in the in the UK um, and in to my knowledge, um, the transition would have been the same in other sort of Latin alphabet um, using um, or alphabet based. Um, writing systems for the most part um, it's not the same everywhere. But I'm a some I'm I'm not a real print historian, but I can say that um, that these technological changes there's a huge amount of technological change that happens when linotype is developed in the first place. Um, you know the idea of a machine doing what was hand setting, um, and that's um, that has been written about. I think I would say again, J. Dakota Brown has a really good history. Um, his dissertation. Um, about labor in the development of computerized type of, of mechanized typesetting um, as part of design more generally. But um, like what I would say is the entire like print, you know, stealing something to print something that goes back to, I don't know, as far as far as I know, that goes back as far as print goes um, and having a having a secret um a secret printing or duplicating machine, you know, among um, in prison, you know, certainly happened under fascist in fascist Italy, and and um, having secret print machines might have been something happening in Venice in like the 16th century, 17th century. Like that's just there throughout, and um, and in conditions of of state censorship, and um, basically print. I would say without a great deal of knowledge, the history of radical printing is a history of stealing machinery, basically, or of using machinery inappropriately to some, um, or using waged machinery inappropriate. The history of, of zines is the history of stealing Xerox machine stuff. You know, you've got, all, that's just, I think it does go back before, but I mean, other people could, could tell who know more. Then we have the question, are there particular skills involved in typesetting poetry from Margareta? Um, yeah, I would say, I mean, depending, I, I would say so, um, that are, so as a, a not a skilled typesetter myself, but also I should say we have people here or at least have had people here like Bethan, um, I know with great knowledge of, of 19th century print technology and labor relations, you could probably chime in at various points. But I think that with typesetting poetry, yes, but also poetry has changed depending on what technology people are writing it with. So, you know, writers now, if you write in word processing, you already have at your fingertips, as it were, a range of ways of indicating how you would want something typeset. You already can see it in a kind of type form in a way that handwriting, the translation from handwriting to print would have involved a great deal more uh, or different interpretive um, decisions on the part of somebody doing that setting and lots of, you know, 
poets have themselves been people who've done that work themselves or done it in conversation with typesetters or printers um, in various ways. But uh, I guess just being able to read poetry <laughs> would be my my answer to that question. I mean, to think about how the page space has something to do with with the with the art um, seems like it's basic to that. Um, both in terms of how something how it affects interpretive choices, but also on the most basic level of, of legibility um and um and order of reading and things like that which might be unsettled by poetry in a way that would be different from with block prose but again people with the technical expertise could probably give a a, a better or different answer to that then i can see we have a raised hand from Ilva. hello um so yeah i First, I just want to say thank you so much for this amazing hour. Uh, I came for the Leslie Feinberg. I stayed for the... <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and uh, being a child of communists myself, uh, I'm also the Swedish translator of Stonebridge Blues, working with that right now. And uh, working also with setting books at... Uh, book publisher here in the south of Sweden where I work so I think a lot about all of these things and I just hosted a, like a full night uh, of like queer activist talks about like a reading of the book through like typesetting as a form like reading the novel and looking at it through so I was like I saw this email earlier this week and I was like what who is this person what is happening uh, so um I'm just so happy to be here and I uh, want to ask you a lot of things, but I also want to ask you, what's your email? Oh, yeah, well, that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that I will, I will type in because we have to. Yes. But I also, so I, I'm also, there was this conference this spring about Stonebridge Blues uh, because it was a 30th uh, year anniversary of it. And there's an anthology being made right now about the book uh, by some researchers in Hamburg at cool. the Gender Studies there. Um, and I would like, I don't know if you know about that, but I think that this, no. that's also very much missing from, from that. Um, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I, uh, I will leave it at that because there are too many questions and probably others have more um i really want to talk about all of that um and hear about the discussions you've been having um because i do think that a lot of discussion of that novel has been amazing and important but there's one experience of reading it that's like this is all about like book saving someone's life and <laughs> like you know and writing and reading and that and that um and that purposeful labor being attached to that that I don't think um has been recognized by critics maybe as much as it could be maybe that doesn't matter but um yeah and I was also going to say that in the second um just in the second chapter of the book like the first actual chapter Jess the protagonist starts working at a print shop setting types the old-fashioned way exactly it's doing hand setting yeah 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 also get their first contact to go to a gay club exactly so yeah the way that they move through the world is colliding with this so i love it exactly yeah okay so i will just yeah i'll share we'll share yeah <laughs> thank you so much and thank you alex and everyone we got a very quick answer to Margareta's question from Bethan, who says that there are some ways in which poetry is actually easier. Prose is more complicated to fit on lines and pages and requires a lot of maths. Um, then we have I a agree with that. <laughs> then we have a question from Nat, um, who says, "Thanks for sharing these incredible family digressions. Can you say more about your methods and what's been harder to translate to text? Specifically, was there an incident?" in your opinion, according to any of your cool comrade family members still in attendance, 
that didn't make it to, the, to your final stage of writing and that you'd be okay to share with us? Sure. Um, I love that question. I mean, there's loads and loads of, of things that, um, that I've cut out of this or, you know, just because things that don't feel like they're necessarily my, my part of a story to tell right now. Um, but, um, in terms of family history, um, I'm thinking about this or actually what I would say is that one of the more complicated things is, you know, so, and, and dad, Mark can speak to this, but also, um, you know, writing about people who worked for, who were employed by my dad. Um, I don't know how much of that is mine to say without talking to them more. Um, so it's more about methods as a non sort of human subject methods. I'm, you know, trained as a text person. <laughs> I'm a literary person. I've worked with documents and archives and stuff like that. I happen to have this glut of informal, um, information that I can get, you know, and I had a sort of discussion, like, do I have to do research ethics clearance to talk to my dad? That seems ridiculous. No, I'm not going to do that. You know, those kinds of questions around that. Um, but yeah, there are questions about like what counts as, um, as a result about like, I mean, I'm not that worried about it in terms like what's really knowledge and what's like, you know, doesn't count as knowledge in relation to where, where those sources of information come. But yeah, I guess I would say those kinds of things I feel less comfortable talking about. I don't know. Dad could, I mean, there are all sorts of funny incidents like that my dad has told me about his work that um, like, I don't know if I want to say while being recorded. Well, <laughs> um but about being asked to do things pro bono, for example, for um, organizations, for for politicians or things like that, asked to print things pro bono for people who had a lot more money than the business did, but were like, but you support a union, so you'll support my political campaign to become president or stuff like that. There are stories like that that exist that I will tell you not um, sometime. <laughs> yeah. I think, sorry, I was muted. Um, ben. Uh, hi, it's actually not your own. I just, I just had a really quick question. Thanks, Sam, this was super interesting. I guess like my question is about, so you've used your family history to think about uh, bigger like historical context around shifts in technology and labor organizing. But I was wondering about the extent to which thinking about queer labor organizing was a way for you to get back into your family history and the extent to which maybe like the work that you've done has kind of like fed back into and revised your like family history and I think part of that question is about thinking about I'm always really interested where people can like document where they've come from what their parents used to do what their grandparents did, what that family history is, which you've been able to do, which I always find really interesting as a person who actually can't do any of that because it, because of that historical context is like lost to me for reasons that we've talked about quite a lot. So I'm really interested in, I guess, like, yeah, your way back into your family through this reading. Mm. I love that observation, Nadia. Um... I, I'm thinking about it. I think that it felt more disjointed to me for a long time, like rather than like as a way into family history, it was more like, here's this thing I'm working on in this way. And here's this stuff that I kind of know in the background. And so I, I've, I think I kind of, I'm, I've always been interested in family history, like many people. I mean, I always like ask questions like which cousin is that one and which is that. I know some people just, I don't know some sort of cataloging or part of my mind 
has wanted to do that, which I don't think everyone has. And I'm, you know, whatever. Um, but it never felt, it didn't feel like connected to, I guess there's a part of me, you know, that knew there was labor history in my background, but it didn't feel like continuous with the queer labor stuff that I was looking at, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know if that's a satisfying answer. And so I've been struggling with how to put these things together. There's a bit of a, a and if I should, or if they're actually two separate pieces of writing, which kind of just to jump in, I saw that um, I think Lisa or Liza had asked about aesthetic and literary forms that the project might take and alternating between scholarly and autobiographical passages. And basically, I don't, I don't know. And I do feel a kind of tension between those, perhaps that's just a result of, of academic training and creative writing training and thinking of those as as separate, even though, you know, I teach in a creative and critical writing and I'm supposed to, you know, and encourage people to, to merge those things. But I guess what I've been really hesitant about doing is trying to smooth over conceptual things that I can't work out. Like if there's something difficult in the, in the theoretical and scholarly work I'm doing, I don't want to just kind of massage that with a bit of storytelling. Cause I think that's a common thing that, that happens in let's say hybrid writing. Um, and it can be quite pleasurable. Um, but if I really don't know something, I don't want to use creativity and um, as a as a way to disguise that, if that yeah. makes sense. Um, and that sounds, I don't know, it's something that I haven't worked out. Um, but I do think that um, that those things are, that those modes coexist for me and that can feel to me like it's okay I haven't sorted through things there's a messiness in my thinking um so I haven't yet worked out those those are some of the contradictory feelings I have about that question I at this point I would say um and why I think I noted at the start that I said I was going to do digressions but then felt myself trying to integrate the digressions in the process of writing if I that... just wanted to say something this is Sam said Mark hi dad Hi to Sam and hi to all my relatives there. And Sam, you have 100% license to say anything you want relating to me and my family and my history. <laughs> and there are some things, yes, that we don't say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I uh, is this my 15 minutes of fame? I don't know, maybe it is. Yeah, there you go, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hi everyone. Thanks, Dad. No, I think- your 15 minutes could have been when the Czech, um, the Czech Literary Guild thought that you were an important scholar and invited you to give lectures um, in Prague, I think. And then you had- Yeah, I, I was 18. Yeah. I had just graduated college, so I declined. High school. Yeah, high school, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. If it's if it's okay with Frankie, I'm gonna take the question in the chat next because it seems to follow on from what you were just saying, um, which is thank you, Sam. Your last remark makes me wonder whether you have are implicitly queering your family history and how <laughs> you thought about the materiality of your own labor so far in various academic, creative, and activist dimensions. Thank you, Xiao. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I. I didn't think of this as implicitly querying my family history because I feel like that's something that I'd done in my in poetry writing stuff that I've done. So like where I've done that with my the stuff with grandfather's FBI file, I feel like maybe it's just become habitual um, as a result of that. Um, but I think that question about labor, academic, creative and activist interventions of labor probably is haunting all of this because it's all, yeah. I mean, it's I, like in that conversation we were just having about like, I'm my job is to, is to do creative work, but also be a scholar. Um, and, um, and I do labor organizing as part of my job and am a rank and file union member in my union. Um, and um, that, yeah, I guess I would say that, and, and questions about precarization and feminization of professions are very, very present in academic labor contexts. I mean, that is sort of 
one of the in in UK higher education, but US as well, the the precarization um, in what appear to be perhaps the what can feel like they might be the end of an entire way of of working or this the and may indeed be that. Um, I think those questions about labor organizing are absolutely like the most live ones in in life in that way. And so I think that the kind of quite I think, you know, for me, Brodeen and Feinberg are, you know, as are both like guides, Brodeen in particular, for thinking about those questions, even though the work that she did was um, you know, in a in a different field as it were, but a number of the challenges feel quite similar. Okay, so um, we have about seven minutes left. So maybe we can take Frankie's question, Helen's question and Anna's question together and then give you the opportunity to, to answer and round up. Okay, wonderful. Um, Frankie. Thanks, hi Sam. Uh, it's Frankie from Sussex from a few years ago. Good to uh... Good to see you and thank you for your fascinating paper. Um, I wanted to ask a, a question that's sort of in some ways quite similar to what Margareta asked about kind of the connection between print and kind of literary form, but maybe to ask you to say a little bit more about the form of political writing. So I, I thought it was one of the things that was really interesting as you kind of touched on these kind of different political formations. Obviously the CPUSA is kind of a major part of the story, but you also mentioned these anarchist scenes, the Parliaments in Detroit and these kind of uh, other spaces are quite potentially allied, but also potentially quite different politics, you know, who may well have been at each other's throats at times, right? Mm. And I guess what I was wondering, you know, thinking about um, the sort of the party newspaper as a type of writing, uh, you know, there's some recent work on the manifesto, I suppose, as a type of political writing that's also a literary genre. And you mentioned the zine as well. Is there also a connection between typesetting and kind of the written expression of, of politics or political form. I hope that makes some sense. Um, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on that. Great. Thanks, Frankie. Um, Helen. Hi. Yes. I um, wanted to say hi to Sam. I'm uh, in Seattle in the US, and I'm the editor of Red Letter Press, which formed really to publish Karen Brodine's book of poetry. And um, I was a comrade and collaborator with Karen as well as Sam in Freedom Socialist Party and Radical Women. So um, there's so many connections. I was also one of those midnight typesetters uh, squeezing <laughs> extra hours out so that our radical newspaper could um, get published. Uh, and what was interesting in the typesetting to me was um, we did, I didn't realize it was going to go extinct um, as we were doing it, but it was interesting that one of the hardest poems in Karen Brodine's book and in new publications of it is one that was based on the technology that existed at the time where it was really easy to make mistakes so that the lines stretch way out and you, she had a found poem with all these throwaway errors of uh, wrong justification and to try to do that on modern typesetting machines is almost very difficult, um, yet it was so common then. And um, I do hope people will look up um, women sitting at the machine thinking, I'll put our link in the chat, but I know international shipping is really impossible. So it is available in different forms online as well. But I think, you know, it's, uh, Karen also came from a communist family background of activists um, and herself was a leader in socialist, feminist, lesbian organizing. Um, so it, I, her poetry to me just really brings out all those connections of technology and politics and, you know, how do we restructure human relations to be how they suit people best. So thanks very much. Thank you, Ellen. And then we had a question, um, Anna had a question. Okay, um, uh, I don't know how to really follow on that, but I think it does relate. I was just so struck um, in your um, talk, Sam, which I which I loved. Um, uh, you were actually talking about um, 
uh, I think both um, in Stonebutch Blues and Women Sitting at the Machine Thinking, by these moments in which you're like tasked with doing this job, that's like taking all of your mental energy for the most part and physical energy. But then there's also something else happening. Like there's this kind of like fugitive um, capacity to um, make something new or different that like, you know, might produce something. We don't know exactly what it's not, you know, um, it's, but it's, it's something else. Um, and um, that's associated with, uh, with like the coding, you know, at the, at the computer or something like that. And I was also really moved by, um, and sort of it's, 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 you know, disheartening, you know, this idea that this is like the, the job of, of being this kind of um, type, um, uh, God, I don't know the technical term, um, when you're setting it at the computer, it's like, it's like always already going to like be, um, become extinct, right? Just like this, like this brief, again, like moment. Um, of, of time in which this job is possible, but it's gonna it's gonna disappear. Um, and I was just I was I was it was a question about like, um, are those moments that you're associating with these kinds of sort of almost sort of obsolescent forms of technology? Like, I suppose it's a question. That I, I think it was maybe Amy who asked something like this. Is this something like that we that exists today at all? Are these kind of fugitive moments kind of like more like you know with with kind of these forms of technology, these forms of kind of like precarious labor that in which like some other kind of thinking is possible? Like is that consign? Like this is like a really kind of like depressing like thought on my part, but like are those moments like fewer and farther between? Like what are the ways in which like our minds like are, you know, all these forms of sort of affective and material labor that we're doing, you know, are, are we losing those moments? Are those something, you know, like, you know, or how do we think about, how do we think about those kinds of moments that you're describing and women sitting at a machine in relation to like where we are now? Like that's, that's sort of the question. Love it. Um, I'm not going to be able to address all of that with the um, depth that it deserves. But I wanted to say that in some ways, um, what Frankie, you raised was kind of beautifully followed by Helen, who answered, you know, having done the, the party newspaper using the same kinds of, you know, Helen, very skilled designer, and um, I think did work as a, as a stripper at some point as well, by which I mean, um, somebody who would prepare plates for <laughs> for um, publication. Is that correct? You did some stripping work, right? Yeah. Stripping, yeah, stripping it deals with the negatives. And yeah. Putting them in place so that you make the plates from them. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but you had occasion to do some of that, to use after hours machinery for all sorts of party political purposes, right? I mean, I, I know, yeah. Um, and, and I think that's extraordinarily common is what I would say is that, that um, you know, leftists who focus who for whom party organizations for whom something like a newspaper remains an important form of propagation let's say um often have had where they could jobs in you know waged work in places that that helped them develop those skills or allowed them to use those skills both for work and and political purposes. I think that's quite, quite common. Um, um, and um, yeah, strongly support everyone getting women sitting at the machine thinking in whatever way you can. Um, and I would also say that Helen has been an incredibly useful resource for all the research I have done, um, as have other comrades. Um, and um, and I actually might want to answer or not answer Anna's question by responding with two paragraphs from Karen Brodine's journals that are not published, but that are in the archives, because I think they kind of answer, first off, a beautiful description of the experience of thinking slash thinking about something else, the kind of, you know, having all your energy being taken on one thing, um, but still having room for something else. Um, and the kind of, let's say, trance thinking that might involve um, that. And then the immediate next paragraph in the journal, which is about 
which is less depressing. So I want to, I mean, then, then the kind of conclusion that, that you are worrying about. So um, this was 81, I think. Um, and she wrote, you know, that typesetting is like driving the whole long route to LA about the same distance in miles. And on that same kind of night, when I lay flat back against the earth, shouldered between parents and saw the stars shooting, falling past my cheekbones into the river of the earth, same kind of night with orange curved moon low to the hill, the four of us aimed toward work and back. It all takes a high gear of attention. That's what's the same. Details clicking by, noticed or not, commas, trees, trucks looming up and easing around. And that's followed shortly thereafter with, it's always when I'm downtown in the living pulse of movement, tired or not, still that human energy in the city. Here, I most believe in the possibility of change, of revolution, because the life is there. And even despite the terrible backbreaking labor of it all, there the purpose is expressed, however altered, twisted beyond recognition. Um, and obviously the connection between the city and the ice, you know, the, the experience for her was easier to make because the, the typesetting shop was in the city for the most part. Um, so that, that connection is there. So I think those questions that the question that would remain is about, yeah, people together, um, or at least having shared power together to shut something down, not do something for her is kind of, um, yeah, is, is vital. And whether that can happen as easily in dispersed, um, geographically dispersed working relations, let's say, is a, is a complex, question, but I think not, not irresolvable, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Or we'll see. Wonderful. Okay. Well, then I think we'll wrap up here. Thank you, Sam, so much. And thank you to everyone who uh, joined and participated for a really, really wonderful event. Have a great afternoon and evening wherever you are, and maybe see you, see you next time. Thank you, Sam.